Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to welcome you. This is the first of this semester's what, what has been named. I don't think I had anything to do with the naming, but it's called the Dean Speaker Series. And I guess they, they didn't ask me because I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have liked it to be called that. Um, but it's great to have you here, and it's great to have John Thacker as our first guest. Um, and, but before I do that, I want to thank Citrus and Jacobs Design Institute for co-sponsoring this particular event, and uh, the California College of the Arts for having the idea to make it happen. <laughs> um, and uh, we have the pleasure tonight here that uh, John Thacker has just arrived from, the, from France, where he lives. He's a Brit, originally. And um, many of you have seen his blog, his sustainable design blog called Doors of Perception, in which he says, to do things differently, we need to see things differently. And I'm hoping that's what we're going to do this evening. It's been really exciting uh, for me, as we've been developing with the College of Engineering, the um, Fung Fellowship, working with some of the design folks on campus, including the Center for New Media and other folks, to think about how we bring design into what we do in public health and products that um, make a difference in, in public health and in wellness. So I think that uh, John will be a terrific person to help lead us on a journey of, of looking at what it means to see things differently. He's traveled the world, he's a philosopher, he's a journalist, he's a prolific author. In fact, outside, you've got his newest book called How to Thrive in the Next Economy, and I encourage you to take a look at it once, once we get out of here and you walk around the side. He's got a, a career which has been all over the place and done amazing things. He was the very first director of the Netherlands Design Institute in Amsterdam, which explains to me why he does speak a few words of Dutch. Um, and uh, he was the program director of the Design of the Time, a social innovation biennial in England. He was commissioner of the 2008 France's main design, Biennale um, the Cité du Dessin. The, he served as the director of research at the Royal College of Art. He was a senior fellow at the Royal College of Art. He was a fellow of, I'm going to butcher this one, Mushashino Art University in Japan, a member of the UK Parliament's uh, Standing Commission on Design, and earlier edited the magazine Design for five years. Um, so he's really done it all. He's written more than 12 books, and you've got the, the newest ones out there. And um, I'm really excited uh, to listen to what he has to say. I'm glad that the dean was able to explain, and it's not an apology, that I'm not um, a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I am basically a, a storyteller with a background in philosophy and a training in journalism. Uh, but by some accidents, uh, I've spent my whole life talking with and to designers and architects and planners and managers about why they do things in this way rather than in another way. And um, so I'm not speaking to you as somebody with a kind of magic solution to the question of public health. I think I'm going to be a bit provocative. Um, but it's one of the subjects in the book, which I'll explain a bit about later, that I have personal experience of the difference between the, the narrative and the rhetoric of the public debates that take place about what we're going to do about the health system, um, the, the crisis of this or that aspect of these very complicated stories, and in the last years, family members who've been ill, old, demented. And I've just, for the first time, had very direct experience of what seems to me an enormous gap between the experience that I'm sure many of us have personally in the dealing with uh, the caring for each other and the ways that official and unofficial support systems work, on the one hand, and this kind of air of crisis or people very militantly proposing simple solutions where probably they're not appropriate. So I, this is a kind of an apology or a, um, a promise that I have a certain kind of interest vested in the story I'm going to tell you tonight. Um, but I'm going to begin with a thing that I don't understand, um, which is to say the kind of strange things that uh, have evolved over my life and maybe two or three generations in terms of what is regarded as the kind of infrastructures and the legacy systems that are so perplex us. Um, and my question is not so much why don't they work, that's obvious. To me, it's a, the question that I have is why have they survived so long when they're clearly so insanely badly conceived and doing more or less the opposite of what they were set up to do? So a story that doesn't compute. 
Secondly, I'm going to make some humble propositions about what I think might be an alternative framework for thinking about the, the notion of health and the notion of systems and the notion of social innovation to uh, go about our objectives in different ways. And then I'm going to talk about the subject of bioregions, which I've decided is the, one of the keys, and it's not my original insight at all, to kind of finding a way to connect all these different people with opinions and actors and interests in a subject and in a place which kind of removes the possibilities for conflict that seem to be present just about everywhere else. So just for a few minutes, the kind of story, which I think you probably know more about than me, but as a storyteller, one of my difficulties is I spent 25 years being told by wise um, friends, do not just talk about things that are wrong because people don't want to hear that, but it's so mesmerizing. That, for example, is one of my favorite pieces of information graphics in my whole career in terms of uh, uh, the new health system in your country here and the, uh, each of those balls, as you presumably if you've seen it, represents in one way or another a so-called actor in the health system. And what I love about this graphic is those, that, that is patience. Can you read that? That small uh, blob at the bottom right hand corner. And I'm told by one of the people from the New York Times who originally commissioned this that the sizes of these blobs are in relation to kind of critical mass of activity, the value creation and so on. So you have a system, <coughs> there you have it, in which the kind of alleged recipients or beneficiaries of it are a rather insignificant part. Obviously crazy, obviously not something that somebody designed on purpose, but there it is. And we all find it to be a perplexing and a alarming situation. We have the mentality called just do dramatic, uh, brutal and expensive things and we can cure and fix things, which I think that um, most of the professionals I've ever talked to say this is not a realistic promise, but a, a policy system, a political system, a cultural system that is hooked on the notion that problems can be solved rather than the reality that in all sorts of life there are situations that cannot be easily fixed or fixed at all, but can be managed, dealt and lived with. This is, I'm not saying that it's an evil thing to spend a measly hundred billion dollars on a cure, search for a cure for cancer, it's just that it, in practice, as we know, will be resources that maybe could have been used more productively in other places, but we could come back to the Q&A. My particular um, current obsession with the madness of it all is the notion of the bio-cluster, so uh, at um, Leslie Roberts School, CCA, I was there, I think, a year ago. And in that time, another four or five enormous and presumably very expensive buildings have arisen just the other side of the freeway, filled with, well, it's not very clear what they're filled with. But the point is, um, they are um, the result of a kind of a massive, massive convergence between the biomedical system and the real estate system in ways that are a really, truly a miracle to see. So what you see downtown in San Francisco is like a rather small example of a global trend. So I don't know if you can read those words. These are just a small number of the 30 to 35 multi, multi billion dollar bio clusters being built around the world. In Stockholm, it's the largest building site in Europe. I think 16,000 researchers of one sort or another are expected to end up there. A surprisingly small number of patients, i.e. zero, um, and then you can see these different words. They have, you know, Genome Valley in Hyderabad, Health Valley in Geneva, Biotop in Berlin, etc., etc. You get the, the message. The promise of health or the promise of a cure for death unlocks unlimited amounts of funds for real estate. Whether these activities will transform the health of the world, only time will tell. But I have to say I'm a bit skeptical. This is the European Union has this entity called the Health Cluster Net whose job it is to multiply these the clusters, and they're the ones who come up the, promising the health-is-wealth relationship. So this is the mission of the European Union in terms of its convergence of medical research and real estate. Um, very successful project um, in its own terms. In terms of public health, I think that's a possibly a separate question. And then recently, uh, I came by accident to, to in, was asked to sort of describe the so-called wellness industry which I vaguely thought was, you know, a few hundred spas and people paying rather over the top for 
you know, lotions in body shops and so on. Oh no, I'm just grossly a million less informed. The wellness industry is $3.4 trillion in round numbers, roughly three times the pharmaceutical industry, which is an impressive achievement by itself. Spas, $94 billion. Actually, I've got another picture. It's three times bigger than pharma, but this is the kind of breakdown of the so-called global wellness economy, and they have a whole series of conferences and websites and so on. Uh, spas, $90 billion a, a, a year industry, has grown 60% since the financial crash of 2008, which is an impressive performance of a crisis-resilient uh, sector. Uh, wellness trips, have you heard of wellness tourism? You travel around the world and that makes you better than what you were when you left. Healthy eating, uh, don't even get me started on healthy eating. Uh, beauty and anti-aging, we know that's a kind of round trillion. That's kind of a very ancient historical part of the business. But workplace wellness, so all, every time there's a kind of trend, somebody will come along and corporatize it and say, if you can spend a whole shed load of money going to a spa, think of your whole company going to a spa, and which is now a, me a small 40 um, billion. And then lifestyle real estate, which is just getting going at 100 billion. That is to say, go and live next to a spa. This is, not, this is separate from golf courses, by the way. So $3.4 trillion of global wellness. This is the quantified self-movement, which I followed. Many of my friends, I have to say, are in this movement, and my, I have friends who are adorned with trackers and machines and gadgets. There's a slightly kind of scary neo-fascist sort of aspect to the visual language of it all. Um, but uh, the, the 400 million devices have been sold so far that you put on your body and that tell you what is happening to your body. And uh, there's a whole, there's an incubator called Rocket, um, Rock Health up the, upstate in New York, which exists only to launch companies to do with health apps and digital devices. And I've been, you know, my friends do it, and I have good friends who feel very healthy as a result of running marathons, wearing their gadgets. And I say, well, maybe you were already healthy before you bought this gadget. And, uh, but I would just, they said I was a sad and backward-looking person <laughs> until... This was literally last week. Scripps trial, it's a only six-month trial, but they have now done quite a large uh, measurement and uh, people wearing these devices. And what an amazing surprise, they don't improve health use or outcomes, which I could have told them for a, probably a more modest sum than the cost of the survey. However, um, the point being that, we can come back to that, the... Um, the promise of health is an economic force by itself, and therefore I'm not suggesting that these business people are crazy. They have understood something which I regard as mystifying, but they understand, like business people do, there's a kind of market in it. But it doesn't answer the question why, apart from the nature of our beings as animals, do people get sick in the first place? Why is it that uh, maybe our lack of health when we're not running marathons, if we're kind of normal people with all the, the ailments, where does the, the lack of perfect health originate? Did you hear this last week? This is, again, it's only last week. 44% of city dwellers in Europe have traces of weed killer in their urine. 44%. That, I think, if somebody had asked me, I would have said it was small. I thought maybe farmers, but that's coming through the food chain. And we don't know what the health or otherwise consequences of that, but it doesn't sound like a good situation. Uh, the general, you, you know about sugars and fats, but I just was rather impressed by the way that the size of the growth of the so-called, you know, the, the doctors and the hospitals and the treatments so closely corresponds to the growth of trans fats and sugars in the diet of modern city-dwelling people. It's pretty close, I think. I'm not suggesting that it's cause and effect far. I will get sued by a soft drinks company, but I think it's a pretty close thing. But I've been to four or five big events where people regard that as either a coincidence or just too inconvenient to talk about without even uh, mentioning the general dissociation between so-called clean aspects of the economy, like um, the, the gigafactory and the terrible um, and very toxifying um, processes that take place to create the raw material. So this is some of the lithium mining slurries in Chile, and that's the thing uh, Mr. Tsing's uh, 
factory in Arizona, a kind of cultural blind spot called, if it's large and clean and very modern, therefore it is a clean process, then we are maybe it's part of a world becoming healthier. Not if you live in Chile, it doesn't. And this is Bangalore, which I go to India a lot. I think most cities have a lot of toxins in the air, but it's measurable now. You can buy all these meters that will kind of tell you what's in the air when you walk down the street. And if it's thought to be somewhat axiomatic that our minds and our bodies and the environment are absolutely, if not the same thing, that at least they influence each other, is it not regarded as partly causing our ill health to have all these toxins in the air for all the processes of the modern world? That's too hard. Why not spend 3.4 trillion on wellness rather than look upstream at that? So, uh, I'm galloping through the kind of... That's the entertaining part because I just think it's the story, as I said at the beginning. How has this absurd separation between the notion of cause and effect um, been able to kind of survive the, the, the era of constraints on resources? We'll come to that. As a non-specialist, uh, my four humble propositions. One, health and well-being are properties of a social and ecological context. They are properties of the places and the ways that we live. They are not something that you deliver, like a pizza, but the, the language of delivery is pervasive across the whole world of the, the, these high health clusters will deliver all sorts of things as if they're cooking up in these expensive buildings cures to the toxins in that street. I'm not sure that they are. But anyway, it's a, prov it's a provocation. Therefore, health is place-based. I don't personally think that's a controversial statement, but I'm just putting it on the table. Wonderful French artist called Céline Boy, who is one of the artists who's beginning to say, how do we kind of resensitize ourselves to the importance of where we are now in a way that stops us being fixated on utopian futures some other place and some other time. Uh, that's a big part of the task. Thirdly, and this is where I learned from my own experience, and I'm sure many people in this room have had it, in general, in terms of caring for each other, 95% by time and, and let alone emotional and attentive effect is, takes place outside the world of hospitals and the big facilities. 95%, that's a lot. But when you look at the way that the kind of the economy is measured or the way that innovation funds are allocated, when you look at the way that these bio clusters are funded and justified, that subject and that fact is just missing from the argument. Uh, the reality being, and this is where actually the reason we aren't all um, already perished from the madness of the systems we've set up, that away from the formal systems and away from the economic aspects of it all, um, the care economy is based on, for the most part, social energy. We do things as we've done through very long periods of time in the basis of our love for each other and the time that we find in otherwise very time-stressed environments. This care economy is huge, but it's also very fragmented. So this is a picture from a, one of the projects you, I mentioned, a, a project I did in England where we said, what is the situation with dementia in a part of England, um, and I'll come back to this a bit later, but the point is that this picture shows you the 80 to 90 different types of people and organization and group that are today in that part of England, and I'm sure in other places as well, actively involved in caring for people with dementia, caring for the carers, s exchanging all sorts of resources and support out without being paid for it, and I'll come back to that, but the point is they are there, all this incredible amount of support and mutual thing, but in a very fragmented way. And therefore, in terms of the transition from a world in which that 95% of care is there but fragmented, we need some way to um, connect the bits together in a way that enables them to be more effective. But also, and I think most importantly, so that we don't, and I'm not contributing to this, remain in an adversarial situation between professionals, researchers, and the rest of the caregiving world. We need a story that defragments the picture, but which is accessible and some way or another is a safe place for all of us in terms of deciding what our priorities are going to be. And for me, and I've been trying for 15 years, talking to lots of people, 
the notion of a bioregion actually is the story that prevent, presents the possibility of defragmenting this discussion about health, what it is, where it comes from, how we're going to get more of it. This is, by the way, uh, a new map of Cascadia. just came out in November. It's about five or six generations. I'll tell you about that later. The point about bioregions is that they are uniquely and unlike, for example, a nation state, unlike, for example, a city, they are um, entities and geographical and cultural and social and ecological uh, places that connect the person and the place, the social and the ecological, which in all the researches that the professionals say about why we trash the planet is because those different aspects of our existences are separated. So person, place, social, ecological come together in a bioregion in a way that doesn't happen in any other geographical form. And once you decide that the health of the bioregion is a kind of coherent, sensible, and motivating and meaningful common good, it starts to remove a lot of the differences and the uh, separations that, as I've said, are a big part of the pr problem. The health of the bioregion is self-evidently a common good. We all want it to be healthy. Whatever our differences, if we're hedge fund managers or uh, people, coal miners, it doesn't really matter. One can start from a position that whatever our other differences and agendas and backgrounds and cultures, the health of the bioregion is something we can all agree is a, a shared objective. And in other words, they create this notion of a duty of care for place, for community, through time in a way that other economic and social concepts really don't do. This is, I'm just asserting this, and you can tell me if you agree later, but I think it begins to create the potential for changing the kind of framework of this debate about health. And it's the most important thing of all to me and the people I've talked to is that if you have something which you want to make healthy, then growth is a good thing in a bioregion, which it isn't in most other aspects of the economy. If health is the value at the center of it all and that one brings our efforts together, the more health, the better. And then growth becomes a good objective rather than the, the deadly one that it is at the moment. So I think that bioregions are real places that represent the possibility for reshaping our economic objectives in a very profound way. But that does slightly raise the question, uh, fine, a nice story, John, you're a storyteller, what does this mean in practice in terms of how, quote, ordinary citizens or different professionals or the different groups that we all spend our time with at the moment, how can we then start to do things to bring the bioregion as a shared value object to life or back to life? Otherwise stated, what actions and supporting platforms are needed for the bioregion to thrive? And uh, this is where I have some propositions based on what's happening elsewhere in the world, which I think when you put the subject of bioregions on the table as a new shared object of work and uh, effort, together with some of the tools and ideas that are coming from other places, I think you have the potential for something pretty exciting. For example, the ideas swirling around in the new economy movement to all the people. We've had this kind of economic crisis for years, people all over the place dreaming up new ways to describe value, new ways to make transactions. It's not that there is a kind of winner, but you have you know, the sharing economy, vast numbers of different groups, many of them very small, interested in the commons, transition towns, which I know quite a lot about in England, Two and a half thousand of those now grown from nothing since 2008. The notion of platform cooperativism is a horrible word, but this is, I'll talk about that later, a conference of two and a half thousand people in New York uh, just before Christmas. Local money everywhere, hackers. All of these are kind of competing, overlapping, different ways of understanding the kind of economy we would like to see in the future. Some of them consider themselves to be green, others less so. The point being, and this, I get a terrible headache trying to understand all these people because there are many eggheads that are involved in you know, things like money concepts or collaboration platforms, and they're very kind of militant and tiny bit sectarian, if the truth be told. But I've been explained that actually one should regard it as a good thing that there are so many different ideas out there about new ways to conceive an economic um, locally and so on. 
and there's a new website called Real Economy Lab in which there are three or four hundred kind of case studies if you're interested. The good thing is that they will carry on doing that whether or not you go there and find out about it. So there's, so to speak, a supply of new models and frameworks and platforms available if we then decide to kind of start to, in small ways, bring a bi-regional framework to life. And that's where, um, it's not an ad for the book, that's what I try to do in the book, is to look at uh, this notion of new economic basis and transactions as uh, they taking place in different forms of meeting daily life needs. So it's not a kind of how-to book, but for all those different subjects that you see on the right, what I do is to say, how are people at the moment meeting those needs in new ways that are probably more socially just and definitely environmentally and ecologically more positive? And that's, so to speak, examples of good news in the flowers scattered around a field. But second question, is there anything we can do to connect these little projects together in frameworks which will allow them to be thriving and more successful um, together than they are on their own? So this is the kind of next stage of moving from letting a thousand flowers bloom, which is okay, but I think it's my proposition is that we need more than that. So I'll give you two examples of where, on a kind of a bi-regional scale, um, people are beginning to figure out how to help the bits come together in a whole, which is a different whole than the holes we've had in the past. And the first is about feeding, because you know food is at the heart of all sub discussions about health and wellness, and it's, we all know it's one of the major determinants of the problems that we have, but it's also one of those subjects which seems to be the most intractable. So I told you that uh, the growth of the biomedical economy is very closely matched by the growth of fat in the diet. And when you start to look at over the 30 or 40 years now that people have tried to understand what is going wrong, why have we got this system that's killing us? My friends at Nourish, who are up, up, in, North, up in this town, made this very beautiful representation of the kind of the whole global food system which explains all the different processes and actors and interests that are taking part, uh, economic system, biological, social, and so on. You can study that or go to the Nourish website. The only problem with that picture, it's a very beautiful piece of imagery, but it isn't terribly obvious what you're supposed to do with that information. So this, to me, is a kind of systems thinking as spectacle rather than systems thinking as actions that we can take. And what I've learned and what they are also learning, and we're all learning, is you need to zoom in and out of these stories in order to find places to intervene in Donella Meadows' immortal ways. How do you do something to change this thing which at the moment is so damaging? And that's why in research, but also in people thinking about cities or thinking about food distribution patterns, when one goes to the subsystems, you begin to see uh, a slightly more recognizable uh, activities that you can imagine changing the subsystems of the big one in some way. But still, these are rather kind of abstract, not very easily accessible things. So these are kind of the subsystems of food in cities, but it's a kind of picture of what's going on. But again, it's not obvious what you're supposed to do about it. It's when you go into another scale of a real place with human beings doing things for and to each other that the notion of a food system suddenly becomes recognizable as, by the way, it's people doing things for each other could do with food. So it's a, this is a some group of grad students in Denmark. We made this um, it's a representation of what you would find by an analyzing the actors in a food system in a city. So you have somebody growing pigs in a humane way, a food truck, a Twitter food truck, a c community kitchen, a bakery, a market, um, an urban farm, and so on. And as you can see, I don't know if you can read those words, an infinite number of possibilities. The point I'm trying to make is that if I were to say to this pig farmer, you really need to find a couple of more ways to have your organically grown, humanely raised meat sold to city people. They could do that by being introduced to the guy driving that Twitter food truck or maybe having a relationship with the community kitchen or whatever. 
connecting two human beings to each other by some means, we can discuss that, start to change the composition of the system and the relationships between these people called food actors. And then once you start to think that if we can connect people to each other in new ways, the performance and the behavior of the system, you then say, can we do this in a more you know, multiple scale? And that's where the notion of the platform comes in. This is, a, I think, a, very, a platform called the Food Assembly. It's a French industrial designer and chef called Guillaume Chevron said, it's, why is it that these um, community-supported agriculture schemes are either expensive or just rather joyless things in which somebody turns up and plonks a box of vegetables on your table once a week? Is it not possible in this day and age to do that in a more flexible and efficient and pleasant way. Three, four years down the line, the industrial designer chef has made a platform in which 20 or 30 farmers can, on the internet, say, I've got beetroot, I've got milk, I've got cheese. Members of the club can then buy from this website the, the food that they want to get. And then they all go and meet in different um, assembly points to, to collect their vegetables. This is a rule of the system. You have to go and meet the person who made or grew your food. You can't have it delivered by a third party. That's a rule of the system. So as well as providing a flexible relationship between city people and the sources of their food, it creates a social connection and then therefore the growth of trust, which is missing from our other transactions um, with food. And that is an intervention in the food system, which is people getting bread and grain and oil in a kind of place once a week. Next step, that's so it's a platform. But we still need to say, well, if it's just like, you know, 2, 3, 4% of the population or 5 or 10%, that still leaves 90% of people who are not using or have access to these systems. And so this is where the third generation activists, and this is a man called Larry Yee at UC Davis, uh, 30, 35 years as a food systems professor, critic, and policymaker has said, we need to create frameworks which allow all these sort of platforms and regional and bioregional systems to be able to grow much more quickly. And his uh, model or platform, his policy framework, is called the Food Commons. And I'm running a tiny bit late, so I'll just gallop through that. It's basically about providing the money system, you know, the financing, the governance, and the kind of structural arrangements for the relocalization of all these activities that take place in any food system, warehousing and so on. You can go and see the Food Commons online if you find this intriguing. I think it's revolutionary because it is based on the observation of the success factors when local food experiments are successful. It's when um, these elements are in place. So it's kind of top down meets bottom up in a way that I haven't seen happening anywhere else. The, uh, anyway, go and check it out online. Um, the point about that model being that you have the world of food system activists, policy makers converging, and then from the third point of view, you have what I think is transformative in a way that even the food commons is not, is the whole kind of left field or right field of the new technologies of encryption to do with how you can create trust between people engaged in shared endeavors. So this is a food farm, an urban farm cooperative in Helsinki, in which they have roughly 100 families who do different degrees of participation in the cultivation of the land. It's a complicated story. You can look it up. The point being that, uh, as you, some of you may know, that when you have 100 people collaborating in a shared enterprise, such as growing food, there's always the danger that one of them will not turn up for work, take more food than they're entitled to, etc., etc. That's the tragedy or the dilemma of the commons through history. How do you deal with the people who uh, deviate from being perfect citizens, namely most of us? Therefore, for literally decades, people have tried to imagine social or legislative or legal or financial incentives and controls to stop bad people behaving badly, like the rest of us, with these new technologies of, um, uh, of encryption and blockchain, you can create ways that we give, um, assess each other's performance and value to a shared enterprise anonymously, but where the opinions are, so to speak, trusted by the group as a whole. It's a slightly complicated story, but 
um, I think that the, what looks like the, you know, the kind of banker's toy of um, Bitcoin over here has the potential to also to be the information architecture for the commons in a way that will make things possible that weren't possible for the last 100 years or so. Um, there's a group in Israel which I can talk about in the Q&A. So you have the architecture of uh, trust combined with all sorts of practical experiments. And then you have bizarre things happening, like this is last, this again, this is last week, uh, December, all right. Um, so Finland is, a, a, they had a plebiscite called, shall we just pay everybody in the country a 800 euros a month and do away with a system of um, benefits and welfare checks and all the stuff that goes with it? It's been discussed and proposed for 30 or 40 years, and it's one of those very fringe original edition of the whole Earth catalog type activities that people thought this will never happen, it's suddenly a serious legislative move in a rather rich, prosperous, uh, sophisticated country. So if you just imagine, say, why just give everybody a, 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 some money to stay alive, 10 minutes, uh, why should that be limited to just giving people 800 euros? Why, do we, why should food not be taken to completely outside the economy? The amount of money wasted on um, the food industry is astronomical, as you know. If you, what, for every calorie that goes into our mouths, 10 calories are expended on packaging, branding, processing, heating, chilling, transporting, and so on. Why not just do away with the whole infrastructure and have a basic right to food in which we all collaborate and participate in the stewarding of the land and the growing of the food? Ah, it's a rather radical proposition, but I have the feeling that radical things are suddenly becoming possible that were completely inconceivable not so long ago. And to finish up, uh, coming back to the, I guess it's sort of um, the subject of caring. So is it possible to imagine a transformation of a care system in the same way that when I'm describing the emerging transformation of the food system? Well, I will tell you what I think could happen. You can tell me if it's feasible. The subject of ageing. Everybody goes on about it. How will the government look after all our old people with dementia? Everywhere in the world this discussion is taking place. To which my own conclusion is it won't. Because it can't. It being the government. Um, we saw at the beginning that we have a slightly uh, unfit for purpose legacy system whose um, complexity and inherent contradictions is, makes it unlikely that that can be repurposed for the question of caring for old people, maybe in bits. We did, however, see that we have on the table the asset of a, an informal care economy which is already existing, which has been there throughout human history and, by the way, is ignored and not counting as GDP, but that's already there. Maybe when we talk about how will somebody look after all these old people with dementia, we have to change the question a bit to a better question. What practical actions would improve daily life for people with dementia and their carers? It's a change of emphasis, but it moves our energies and our thoughts and our creativity to what is already there, namely the care that is taking place, rather than to something hypothetical and utopian and distant, such as something called a cure, which we can have opinions about that. So that's a different question. That yields a whole series of very practical steps. So if you remember, I talked about this fragmented and somewhat vibrant but kind of possibly incoherent informal economy of carers, which, as a matter of fact, which is what I learned very powerfully in my own situation, the professionals and the communities very flexibly and effectively collaborate with each other more or less outside the kind of formal structures of what they are alleged to be doing. So the social economy includes the professionals of different kinds. So we know that. And you're, some of you are professionals. You know this as well as I do. What is not so uh, evident, unless you go and look for it, are the places in the world where this social economy is being reimagined in a geographical or bioregional way um, in which the notion of the state or the city or the region as the placeholder for helping people to collaborate better is becoming to life. And this is, I don't know if you know about the Bologna experiment, but the, the city and the region of Bologna have a whole series of extraordinary, um, quite mature experiments now in the collaborative organization of elder care. Eighty percent of old people in Bologna uh, are looked after either at home or in a facility or in some 
hybrid combinations by cooperative, collaborative enterprises, 80%. Also in Montreal, and two or three other places, some, some in Japan. I would be lying if I, that is not a bioregion, but as far as I'm concerned, we're on the way to having a kind of convergence between the bioregion as we want our region to be healthy, why should our region not be healthy, um, and then combining that with the notion that we have to collaborate and share time, resources, knowledge, love in caring for each other. And the bioregion said we want our region to be healthy, we want our care ecosystems to be healthy, we want our land to be healthy. There's no disagreement about any of that. It provides a shared endeavor that somewhat, it doesn't remove completely the question of the economic crisis that envelops us, but it's at least somewhere where you can do positive work as a step in the right direction, which is what's happening. So this is some of my associates in London who um, are using the skills that have been developed to design websites for selling hot dogs online or high-end holidays or spa treatments. Many of these young designers are very keen to find more meaningful ways to use their skills. How you create communications that uh, change the expectation of care as something provided by a commercial company to something that the community does as it does for itself. So what you can see here is, you remember my map, these are actors in a place, in a real location, and what happens is that you put onto the map a, ca a taxi driver, a hospital, a restaurant, you see where there are connections physically happening, and they use little bits of string to show that there is a live connection, and then once you've done that, you get a three-dimensional picture of where there might be gaps. It's nothing, it's not rocket science, but it's very, very powerful to have a kind of 3D picture of a care ecosystem on a table, because then everybody can stand around the table and say, why is that uh, restaurant not in the story here? They actually, uh, they're very, uh, they have very nice uh, kitchen, could they be part of the soup uh, kitchens for our elder citizens and so on? And that's beginning to happen in a very powerful way. It's a neutral space. It shows, let's just go and connect those two human beings together and that changes the performance of the system. When I started work, we thought that it was, the task was to kind of improve the information available. So this is a project six years ago called Alzheimer 100. We did two years of work about what practical steps would improve life for people with dementia and their carers. We ended up thinking, well, basically what we need is to use our, you know, the internet and mobile phones and web platforms to improve the way that officials communicate with their clients. So this notion of delivery kind of somewhat shaped our activities. And we did indeed then hand over the plans which were developed by the Alzheimer's Society for a kind of signposting service. But then a very strange thing happened. The Alzheimer's Society spent, I think, I'm not sure if it was 200, between two and three hundred dollars on an off-the-shelf discussion forum saying, well, we, as well as all these things about signposting services and modernizing our performance as a care delivery organization, they made this place where people could just communicate with each other, and that has completely exploded in terms of the volume. I don't know if you can read there. They have 80,000 threads, um, one and a quarter million uh, posts, you know, 50, 60,000 active members at any one time. An off-the-shelf discussion platform has completely changed the capacity of people who are caring, people are being cared for, to not just provide practical information, but basic sort of solidarity. A huge amount of the posts, and I do recommend you just out of sheer, to be inspired by how very strangely simple $200 things can transform a care ecosystem. It's nothing to do with bioregions. Just go and check out the Alzheimer's Society talking point. It's amazing. You can, a lot of it is about people just venting about the difficulty of their job as a carer, but lots of practical stuff as well. So it's both. It's not some kind of morally kind of uplifting example of people. You know, people complain like crazy about their crazy parents or whatever. It's just, and it's, a lot of it's funny, and it's just human and real. And that's just an example of a technology being used to release energies and connect people to each other in ways that no amount of kind of official work can do that. And then the day before I left, Wales um, is passing a legislation 
which includes a duty of care to future generations. Not such a small country. I'm going to stop. It says one minute. So well done to the Welsh, well done to Bologna, well done to Montreal. Um, all over the world, these kind of changes are moving from the kind of realm of stories told by people like me to real world activities, which is why I remain optimistic, despite the many reasons for thinking otherwise. Thank you. As the floor is indeed open, do I, did somebody tell me there was a mic? I think we can be, probably be loud enough. So you can either be loud enough or are we recording though? Yeah. So we want to, if we're recording, it's nice to use a mic. Greg. <laughs> There's, can I start with you? Are you doing this? Either way, I, I said one. You said I'm going to lean on here in a nonchalant way. I saw him. Can you ask her to hand. tell us what her name is before? The, uh, yeah, yeah. My name is Michelle. Thank you. Um, and my question is: Can you talk more about the blockchains for common services? I can. So uh, I am not a nerd. Uh, the question was: Can I talk about more about blockchain? The best, like that. You want me to dance? I'm getting these very curious signals like that, which is not based on shutting up. It's about moving. Okay. Uh, I can, but actually I can also recommend that if you want to, the, there's a very, very clear story about the relationship between this kind of technology and trust communities and how you create trust in commons-based enterprises. If you look at the, uh, an organization called Lazoos, L-A-Z-O-O-Z, -O -O which is an Israeli company that is... Um, has designed rather explicitly to deal with the question of how you can help people collaborate and trust each other other than with institutions. They're doing it for transportation, they're not doing it for care, but the basic model I think is interesting. It's, um, it's early days, but I just think that, I mean, I, how many people in here know about commoning? Is commoning part of your, yeah, a few. But the basic idea is that when you're trying to find ways to, for example, create a care ecosystem which deals with the needs of companies to make profits, you kind of get locked into a kind of very narrow frame of possibilities. But if you start from the proposition that the care economy already exists, 80, 90 percent of the caring is done outside the realm of economic, you know, financial transactions, but you want to have more of it and better of it and more people participating, you have the question of how do we trust each other how do we know that person X is doing their bit to the elder care ecosystem and person Y isn't freeloading? So this is a very old problem for the question of doing things in social collaborations, which I think this new technology provides a way maybe through to some of those things. If it's true, it's completely radical in its potential, but it's early days. And you know where I, if you wildly disagree, having checked out the zoos, you can tell me, but I think it's pretty important. Okay, let's move the mic across to Greg Niemeyer, and if, if I don't say your name, because I'm terrible at names, if you um, say your name when you start talking, that'd be nice. Thank you. I'm with you on the blockchain. I'm not good at here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I got you. I'm with you on the blockchains. That's a great, uh, great opportunity. My question is about social capital and its generation, but when people fall ill, oftentimes they feel ashamed and they want to go away and they feel like they're not part of you know, normally functioning society anymore and therefore isolate themselves and see their illness in a, in a sense as a failure. And the kind of uh, de scenario you're describing is indeed the way to address that, but it's h often hard to change the self-image of the patient um, uh, from, a, from, a, from a failure to a person who deserves care and support. How, how do you think aesthetics and uh, uh, re representation of illness itself could help there? That's a very uh, deep question, which I don't really think I'm qualified to answer. I can maybe uh, talk about something slightly related. So the question is, how can we change the behavior that is triggered by the very word disease or illness? And we suddenly we, we become passive, we become dependent, or we become socially isolated just because it's such an unpleasant, it triggers bad things. The most, I was telling somebody just earlier today, in the transition town movement, they have a practice called inner transition, which is about the phenomenon that people who are engaged in care, for example, or uh, activism or 
trying to do the right thing, there's a very widespread phenomenon that people burn out because they do it for months or years and they really run on enthusiasm, but they don't know how to or don't get support from their community. So in the transition town movement, there, there's a training program called We Must Look Out for Other People Who Are Burning Out, Isolated, Scared to Ask for Help, and that rather than expecting everybody to suddenly be very kind of open and confident and saying, yeah, I need help, which is asking a lot, they look at say whether, whether there's a training program, how do we, what are the signs for somebody who needs help, and then reaching out for, to that person, say, by the way, and finding people like me with loud voices are bad at it, but the whole business of how social support can be a sort of proactive thing in which we look for people who might be isolated and needing it. The role of art in that I don't know, except that they, a lot of the kind of practices that come out of that particular world are involve things like theatre and and, and dance and so on, where you find out people able to express you know, vulnerability other than saying, yes, by the way, I need help, but I don't want to exaggerate the role of you know, arts practice in that, but it's one of the areas which overlaps it. Maybe you can tell me, since you asked the question I can't answer. No, Do you have examples? The image of the patient is, is a two-way image, one that the patient holds and one that the society around the patient holds. Right. And, and it is the society around the patient that can change that image as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I think that what's very interesting for me when you were talking about that is that where does disability fall into that? Yes. And it seems to me that one of the things that's been really nice to see is that as we normalize disability, if, if there is such a thing as normalizing disability, design of things that are associated with disability comes in. So I can remember that you know, a wheelchair looked like a bedpan. I mean, it was something that you wouldn't want to go anywhere near. It was awful. And now you see people who have transportation or mobility problems you know, cruising around on things that are as cool looking as Razor scooters you know, were or whatever. And I can't help but think that as you normalize something because you make it worthy of design, you make it more acceptable and less stigmatized and whatever. I mean, I just, I, I don't, it seems to me there is something there. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I've got a, a, an elderly parent in a care home as well who is just for the first time realizing that maybe designers have a useful role to play because he's you know, in a situation where things are badly organized and badly designed for nobody's fault, just a kind of legacy approach to doing things. And he says, why do they have to do that, whatever that is? I say that's the kind of, because it's a badly designed process or they not, the training is badly conceived or whatever. And he said, oh, that's what you do, he says, you know, age 95. So we're getting, you know, we come together at a rather late <laughs> stage, but, uh, but are you all right? And what's great, I think, about the designers and the artists is that when you get experience in the work, you stop doing it out of, you know, the sentiment and being cute and looking after people. That's the first stage of what design, then they grow out of that. In my world of... of words, the language that we use is tremendously important. I don't know if it's, I think I was very impressed on the train up here um, that the, the transportation authority talks about elderly people and people with different disability on the, where you protect the, um, there's a Eating. place where you can, for wheelchairs I guess. In uh, most European countries they still talk about the elderly or the disabled or blind, the blind and it's a really very hard to change the way that, that but that just little tricks of language have a tremendously negative effect if they're not fixed, but America's very good at that. It's hard to keep up with here, because it does change all the time. <laughs> yes. More questions? Please. Hi, my name is Carrie Gladstone. Uh, I have a question about, a lot of our current institutions segregate by age. When you think about schools, when you think about even work life, there are times when people are in different things. And as churches and some of these places where people used to come together across age become less important, what are going to be those new gathering points and gathering places so that we're developing a robust care economy? That's a great question. Although I'm not, I, I don't totally, I think that you're describing a very real general picture for the last kind of 50 years. But what I see more and more is the opposite beginning to happen. So have you seen in Holland, Norway, Italy, People are now creating, for example, care environments for kindergartens and elders 
because there are kind of connected and related services that have to be provided, not to mention legislative requirements. And everybody loves it, and it's fantastic. And the, the, the Norwegians in particular, they've always done things like that. They have shared multi-generational things. Um, I also think that the question of the churches has been transformed by the Pope's uh, uh, publication, I doubt how secret, all over the, Europe. It's just amazing for the first time that you have people of faith and people of very kind of secular or even pagan people deciding that there's far more action in potential action in using churches and using church organization, which that simply didn't exist a year ago. It's amazing. So I'm now getting involved. It's a, there's an organization of eco-Jesuits, very radical bunch of people, I must say, know far more about uh, social uh, relationships with ecology than, than I do, and they're, but they've been kind of doing their thing in the, the Jesuit kind of system, and now they're kind of coming out thanks to the Pope's uh, encyclical. So, I, yeah, I'm not answering your question, but I think there's a lot of ex ex exceptions to your proposition. It's hard in this um, election season to see that in this country. <laughs> but <laughs> It's how you frame the picture. It's very... <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. Hello, my name is Erica Good. I was on the California Commission for Aging for six years, and there's quite a bit of trying to get, for example, the... Pasadena Community Center is called a community center. It's not a senior center. And they have a whole row of tables where people outside of the rooms where anyone is doing yoga or having a lecture or whatever is just sitting there and having a really nice conversation or playing chess with somebody else or reading the paper because there's a big coffee center in there. The other thing that they did was just what you were talking about where there is a children's center across the way and the Older folks are invited to come in to this daycare center, which is, you know, kids up until the age of five, pre-K. And so there's a lot of sort of, it's across a grassy sort of playground. So if they want to get involved with kids, some old people just don't want to ever deal with another child. But if they do, it, yeah. it works. The other thing that my best friend is becoming a demented person. And I was supposed to be one of the three legs of the stool to help her. And the biggest problem was twofold. She has always been helping other people. That's the way she operates. But she plays the piano, she still plays the guitar, and she can still crack a joke now that she's on a set of good Parkinson's medicines and a little other sort of thing. So she, she doesn't have a very good medical care system. She's at Kaiser and they don't see her very often. but. And she's still driving, which is nerve-wracking. But the thing that f really helped was to have her look at a paradigm shift where maybe she can start volunteering in the bookstore and just reshelving things. Or somewhere where she can be in the community in Mill Valley where she's more engaged. But between several of us, it's sort of like you pay it out and you get it back. She's getting it back because so many of us really care about her because she's been a good person. But it's that paradigm shift. Let's see if we can't help you still be a helpful community person. And I think that's really the key in a lot of old people who just feel like they might as well stab themselves. No, it's, uh, it's, I, we all know that the, you know, being old and, and have, have, there is no solution to it. There are ways in which we deal with the situation and the, we need ways of reaching out to get help. But there's a lot of help being, as I said in my story, there's a lot of help being given all over the place. So there's little gaps in, sort of sp in, the, in the system to be filled. But it's not about some breakthrough social system. That's not going to happen. But I just find in my own experience that there's so much that's amazing happening. Sorry, Madam. I'm going to suggest that we take the last two and then retire okay. out to reception, so back yeah. there, um, the microphone, and then up here. So I, I, I'm curious what your take on people's attachment to authority is. I knew it would be tough at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> nice small questions. I mean, yes. <laughs> I, I've, I've been a massage therapist for 20 years, and I can tell you that I've just heard some of the most cuckoo stuff that doctors have told people. <laughs> But they go, they go, and they go, and they go, and it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, the buildings are getting bigger. I don't know. I think they're breeding somewhere. I, I just, what is, <laughs> what is the attachment in our, when we're scared, when we're, or for our health? I get the wellness thing. That's industrial. But, but the thing I don't get 
is the attachment to authority that keeps us sort of chained, especially in the United States, to this system that we've cooked up. So what's, what's your take on that? Uh, my take on it is that somebody else must know the answer to that <laughs> question. I just think that, in my I just give a very personal answer. As far as I'm concerned, the, it, the white coat effect is actually true. I feel better if I'm feeling ill and I go to a doctor and he says I'm not dying, then I immediately decide I'm not dying. So that may not yeah. be a kind of medical transaction, but it works. The trouble is that um, we've got into this position whereby a very tiny number of individuals have the power of reassurance rather than you know, a broader range of people. We need shamans or, I don't know, people who are, of which there are more. But they've been corrupted by profit. Their opinions are no longer to be trusted a lot of times. I, I did, but I just learned a few decades ago not to try and attack the doctor system because that's kind of not the way to Oh, change. I'll do it. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> uh, sure, but yeah, exactly. I just choose to look for things that where we can make small improvements to things that are already going well. That's my kind of niche, is that. And the doctors, they'll get there, come up in, in the fullness of time, but maybe probably quite a lot of time. Anyway, that's a big story. Is it? Yeah. Hi, my nice. name is Denise, and I'm aware of the communal life, so I've been following it. It seems there are a lot more in Europe than here. Can you tell us your observation? Is it more maybe government is actually talking about it, or is there some um, things that they're doing? Because, or I don't know if it's the the way the economical system, but you see, I mean, I've watched several documentaries that how people live in um, Denmark, that they actually have this communal neighborhood that people as couples, um, single parents, they're elderly people, and the whole community takes care of the children. So while you're at work, your child go to the neighborhood and everybody takes care of them. But you don't see these, or maybe I haven't heard those much in the United States, so... I I just think that there are examples throughout space, time, and history in which things were done in a more sensible way. I mean, I think today, like 80% of the population of the world doesn't have access to paid child care or elder care or anything else. And, and, and but so communities of different sorts deal with it as best they can. You know, you have a, a terrible economic crisis here, as we do in Europe, in which vast numbers of facilities and individuals and professionals that would have been caring in the 10 years ago, just not there anymore. Things are being done, you know, hand to mouth. And that's a, it's to do with the hand to mouthness, which is very real, because I, n n it's places all over your country which are very inspiring examples of people looking after each other. It's just they don't get figure very prominently in the narrative of t collapse and disaster, which is, is true, but it's also there are two stories happening simultaneously. So I think part of the job of a storyteller like me is to say, Yes, it's all very bad out there, but yes, there are also good things, and let's see if we can help the good things do more of it. Right, well, thank you, John, and thank you all for coming. Yeah. And uh, I invite you to uh, step on outside. Thank you. <laughs>